My name's Graham Town. I'm from the Department of Engineering here at Macquarie Uni. I'm a member of the Sustainable Energy Systems Engineering Group. Uh, my current focus in, in research is on uh, energy and uh, in particular electric vehicles. And uh, today I was going to talk about energy in general and then move towards energy infrastructure. Uh, and uh, we'll finish with a little bit about electric vehicles in that. Uh, just a bit of background about me. Um, I've done a whole range of things in my career. I was an engineering trainee with AWA for eight years where I worked on electronics and communication stuff. I did a PhD in medical imaging. Uh, I then did a lot of research in photonics. But the last five years I've really been concentrating on energy technology and systems because I think this is a big problem for all of us uh, over the next couple of decades. Um, I've got a mandatory bad joke to uh, get your attention and get things going. So, what's another name for a silly old man or woman? One, two, three. A fossil fool. <laughs> Good, one, one person laughed. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the overview. Um, this is where we all live and we share this space. We and everything we do, um, life runs on energy and uh, life has been described as a as sort of a thin film on the surface of, of this earth. But uh, ultimately what powers that life comes from, energy comes from the sun in the form of either stored energy in fossil fuels or in sunlight, wind and waves, those sorts of things. So this lesson is about energy, about how we use it, how we manage it and how we can get smarter in, in um, how we use and manage it. And, and actually we'll have to do that over the next couple of decades. So this really affects you guys quite directly. Um, this is an overview of the talk. I won't read through all of this stuff, but um, there's a lot in the slides and I'm not gonna get a chance to cover everything. So we'll skip through some things uh, to keep to time. If you have any questions at any time, maybe just wave at me and I can stop and, and we can have a, a discussion around that point. Uh, at some points I'll stop and maybe ask you questions as well. Um, the last point there, the talking point, one thing to think about uh, as we work through this presentation is how do you think energy infrastructure will change? And by infrastructure I mean uh, the poles and wires that bring electricity to your houses, the um, the, the coal and the petrol that's mined and, and powers your cars and, and industry and so on. Uh, how, how is all that going to change going forward? And, and can we draw any analogies? Can we learn anything from history in the past with energy? So defini definition of energy, you probably know this stuff. You can change energy from one form to another and you're probably familiar with some of these different forms of energy, electric, magnetic, thermal, mechanical, gravitational and so on. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about those things. I'm going to talk in, in general terms. Uh, you can also define two classes of energy. There's kinetic energy and potential energy, which you've probably heard about in connection with objects that have mass. Um, something that you may not have heard about is a grade of energy. We can talk about a grade of energy, which has to do with system disorder. So, for example, thermal energy is a low grade of energy compared to electrical or chemical energy. Do you uh, have any idea why that might be? So, basically, it's easier to turn electrical or chemical energy into thermal energy. That's going down the grade uh, than it is to turn thermal energy into electrical or chemical energy. So, depending on where which direction it's easy to go in, that tells you what the grade of energy is. Energy is fundamentally related to forces. Work or energy is force times distance, you'd be familiar with that idea. Whether it's nuclear, electromagnetic or gravitational. And of course you measure energy and the units of energy are in joules. Work can be positive or negative depending on whether energy is going into or out of a system. And don't get confused between energy and power. Power is just energy per unit time or work done per unit time. Energy is, a, is an amount and power is a rate. And sometimes people get mixed up between the two. 
So where do we get our energy from? Um, these slides are from uh, various websites and you can get the details off, off the slides. But, uh, and this one's a few years old, but it shows you the breakdown of where we get our energy from um, different sources. And largely it's, it's fossil fuels. The large ones down the bottom there are coal, gas, um, hydro and so on. Uh, the, the renewable energy sources such as wind and photovoltaic are only the few percent at the very top. Now why is this? Why do we get most of our energy from fossil fuels? Well, there's good reasons for that. Uh, they're high in energy density. When you burn uh, fossil fuels, uh, you get a lot more energy out than, than you would by burning some other things. Um, also, fossil fuels are easy to transport. You can put them in your car. Uh, they're relatively safe and, and easy to use. So that's why we've got an industry now built around fossil fuels. But uh, they have impacts, and you'd be aware probably that, that when you burn fossil fuels, you get carbon dioxide emissions. And it's interesting to look at what the applications of energy are that, that produce these emissions. One is generating electricity, and the other one is transportation. And then there's a group of others, including agriculture. So about a third of uh, the fossil fuels that we, we burn to produce energy and do things with go into generating electricity, which then goes on to doing other work. And another third goes in transportation, just driving around, moving products around, uh, moving society. So they're two very large applications of energy and particularly transportation uh, and to a large extent also electricity are derived from burning fossil fuels. Coal in the case of electricity, petroleum in the case of transport. Now this diagram looks relatively complicated but basically on the left hand side you have sources of energy going in then you process them in some way, and then on the right-hand side, you've got useful work coming out. And again, you can see in the pink boxes the breakdown between the amounts of energy used in transport, residential, and other, other applications. You can also see how much goes through electricity generation. The bulk of petroleum goes into transport, and a small proportion of that, about 5%, comes out as actually transport movement. The larger part of that comes out as, um, the 21% of the, the total comes out of, as heat or rejected energy. In fact, when you look at the balance of what's going in and what's coming out, most of the energy inputs end up as heat or rejected energy. They don't actually use, end up as useful work or useful outputs. So that's uh, maybe a problem. Uh, there's some fundamental limits there, but that's something worth being aware of. So when we're using energy, um, particularly fossil fuels, um, a lot of it is ending up as waste. And, in, and additionally, of course, we've got carbon emissions. So again, you can see the breakdown there between the inputs and what carbon is produced from what, what uh, applications. In Australia, it's pretty similar to the rest of the world. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the breakdown of this in detail, but uh, some interesting numbers to note there are that we consume about a total of 6,000 petajoules of energy per year, and we produce about 20,000 petajoules per year. So we consume less than we produce, which means I guess we're either storing or exporting quite a lot of energy. If we look at um, the solar resources we have, um, so I'm gonna focus on solar energy for a moment. This map gives you um, solar irradiance across the whole world. And you can see that in Australia, we're pretty well endowed with, with solar energy. About the only place that you would say has more is Africa. Um, so we've got a lot of solar energy. Uh, I could show you the same thing for wind. We're also pretty well endowed with, with wind energy. This table gives us a comparison between different forms of energy that we, we have in Australia. And, and again, we're very well endowed with all these different sources of energy. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit difficult to convert between the, the units of the different types there, but if you look at solar potential, potential solar energy, it's 25,000 million million um, megawatt, uh, mega, 25,000 million million watt hours per year. So energy in this case is measured in watts times hours. How much space on, on the Australian continent do you think would be required to produce that amount of energy? Well, you can go through the numbers and because the numbers are pretty big, I've put down a table there of the SI prefixes that, that apply here. So 10 to the nine, you probably know is giga. Uh, 10 to the 12, you probably 
haven't heard is Terra, and I hadn't even looked at uh, 10 to the 24, which is Yotta. Uh, but anyway, they're, they're pretty big numbers. Now, if, if you consider that about four kilowatt hours per metre squared per day of solar energy uh, falls on, on Australia, and you multiply that out, uh, you get about half, one and a half megawatt hours per metre squared per year. Um, or if you convert that to joules, then you get about five gigajoules per metre squared per year. And if you look at, remember on that previous slide, it was 6,000 petajoules of energy that we use in Australia per year. You divide the numbers out, you need an area about 34 kilometres by 34 kilometres covered in solar cells to produce um, the amount of energy that we use in Australia every year. Uh, even if you take into account inefficiencies, it wouldn't be more than 70 to 100 kilometres square of area would, if it was all converted to solar energy, uh, produce more energy than we need per year. I haven't talked about climate change or global warming or any of those things yet. Um, you probably have heard of these things. And um, the question is, if we keep on going, uh, keep on using fossil fuels the way that we have been, what's going to happen? So my question to you is, what do we need to do about energy? Save it, that's a good answer, yep. That's one of the things that comes down the list actually. So what I had here was stop using fossil fuels basically because it's damaging the environment. But the question, that's one of the answers. There's actually other reasons why we need to stop using fossil fuels and move more to renewables. What would those other reasons be? Absolutely, so um, climate change was the first one. Cost is the second one, and the third one you just got, which is sustainability. Fossil fuels are a finite resource. And actually, if we keep using them at the rate that we're using them now, they're probably gonna, at least petroleum, is likely to run out sometime in the second half of this century. So we're gonna have to find alternatives anyway. Okay, so uh, two alternatives to using fossil fuels include, so, um, okay, I've put them back to front, unfortunately, but using sustainable sources of energy, finding alternatives, renewable energy sources is, is the one. And Anthony's already mentioned the other one, which is using less energy, whatever form of energy it is, just use less of it. So improve the efficiency with which we're utilising our energy resources. And then even if it's fossil fuels, it will last longer. So uh, what I'm going to do now is go through in a little bit more detail each of these reasons and then we'll get on to a bit more about infrastructure. So as far as the options go, um, renewable energy. So you've probably heard that we've just passed, I think, 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're not, it's never going to drop below that again until we reduce our carbon emissions. And this is having a... Um, uh, an impact or it will have an impact increasingly on, on the climate. Uh, for example, extreme weather events and it can also um, threaten the food chain, both uh, on land and in the ocean. Um, carbon can result in acidification of the ocean, which can um, hurt the, uh, the small animals, which have um, um, cal calciferous uh, shells, if you like. Uh, and they're the source of the food chain, so everything comes from them. If we damage them, we damage everything else. So that's, that's one of the reasons, and, and I don't think I need to go into to more detail about that. I'm not an expert on climate change by any means, but it's one of the motivations for me to uh, think about better ways to use energy. Another reason is cost, and this one is often not considered, but there's a lot of subsidies going to fossil fuels these days. And if you added up the costs, you'd probably find that actually a lot of the renewable energy sources are um, similar, similar cost or even less expensive than using fossil fuels after the subsidies have been taken away. I'm not going to go into the details of this. You can read the text of this. Um, but it's certainly a reason to move away from fossil fuels. It would cost less in the long run. 
And the third one uh, you've already mentioned is, is resource depletion. Um, if you look at the graph on the left there, you've got um, uh, the red lines, which is up till now, the, uh, the, our consumption and, and discovery of, of petroleum oil. And then uh, from about 2010 on, or around now on, um, what's happening is that there is a growing gap between the fossil fuels that we've discovered, or the petroleum that we've discovered, and the petroleum that we're using. And in fact, we're using petroleum at a higher rate now than we're discovering it. So we've passed what some people would call peak oil, which means that it's going to run out sometime in the future. And according to this graph, it's about 2050. What's going to happen, of course, is as oil becomes more scarce and less available, the cost is likely to go up, and that improves the, um, the economics of renewable energy as well. So, uh, yeah, at current usage rates, oil will run out around the middle of the century. Um, here's another interesting plot which I found in the literature, and it links human population to sources of energy. So, um, Basically what it's showing is a number of different sources of energy along the bottom there from firewood, coal and, and oil. Oil is the big white peak and it's traced population in millions on the left hand side against that. So you can see that as energy and fuels have become more available, population has grown almost uh, along with it. So the question then is if we run out of fossil fuels, which has been our major source of energy in the past, what's going to happen to population? According to this graph, it could plummet, uh, halve or, or whatever, over, over the, the next century. It's, not probably, it's probably not quite that simple. Can you think of anything else that has caused an increase in population over the last century or so, other than our use of oil? I'll, I'll uh, rather than let you stew, uh, healthcare basically. So um, healthcare's improved, uh, the health of the general population's improved, and so survival rates have improved. And uh, if we lose energy, we don't necessarily lose the, the benefits of healthcare. It may suffer, but we don't lose that entirely. So whether, we, um, whether the population decreases when, when our energy resources decrease or not is, is a question that we probably can't answer. It really depends on how we manage that energy, which is what the, the rest of this uh, presentation is about. But certainly it would help if we could use less energy. And then we would re avoid reducing our population and also maintain our living standards. Um, so using less energy is, is the key. That's important. And then the other uh, strategy is to replace fossil fuels with sustainable energy sources. There's a difference here between sustainable and renewable. Um, I'm not sure if you would know what it is, but let me ask. It's actually on the slide. Renewable means naturally replenished, so we're using it, but it's always being provided. Um, sustainable uh, could be nuclear energy, for example, because it keeps us nuclear energy at the moment. There's more than we need for the next couple of centuries. Uh, ultimately, though, that one would run out as well. So calling that one sustainable, it's, it's all relative. OK, some practical considerations around energy. Um, how we use energy and whether we use it depends on a number of things. Is it available on demand? Sunlight is not available on, the, on demand. You have to store it if you want to use it at night time. So you would be uh, taking photovoltaic energy, storing it in a battery and using it at night if it's not available on demand is, is one example. Uh, you can also store energy in thermal, mechanical, chemical, other, other forms than electrical. Um, is the energy available where you want to use it? If not, then you have to be able to transport it. So that's why we've got pipelines all over the country and electric wires all over the country. They are transporting energy from where it's produced to where it's used, largely in the cities. Uh, also, is the energy in the form that you need it? Uh, if you want to use electricity, then you'd prefer to get a wire to your house. Um, but if you've only got chemical energy coming in uh, or mechanical energy, you have to convert it to electricity. So then energy conversion matters, uh, it's required, and the efficiency with which you convert energy matters. 
And as I mentioned before, converting energy from higher forms to lower forms is easier than going back up the chain. So the last uh, five or ten minutes I'll talk about energy infrastructure and electric vehicles. So this is a, a map showing evolution of our electricity distribution, generation and distribution system from the past to the future. Uh, it's from the International Energy Agency. In the past, everything was centralised in terms of generation and then you had wires going out to all the consumers, which there were many of, and they were distributed around. So energy flowed from the generators to the consumers one way. And the generators and the distributors controlled the network. The consumers didn't really have any control over the network. Currently, we're in the, we are in the middle. In the future, we're going to have much more distributed energy generation. That means photovoltaics on roofs, fuel cells in garages, uh, wind uh, spread around and so on. And that distributed energy is going to need to be connected to all of us through our existing infrastructure and, and new infrastructure. And moreover, it's going to have to be managed and we're going to be more responsible for our own use of energy. And this means, uh, and in order to do this, there's not only an electrical infrastructure, wires connecting us to the sources of energy, but communications will be monitoring and managing how that energy is distributed and used in the network. And this is the huge challenge for particularly electrical engineers over the next couple of decades to implement this smart grid or uh, we're starting to use a term called the Internet of Energy. You can think about future energy systems as working a little bit like the Internet. What do you think one of the advantages of having distributed energy might be? Think back to analogies with the Internet. One of the reasons that the Internet was um, invented was so that we would have communications which was robust. Uh, for example, in a war, if part of the communication network got taken out, the rest of it would continue to work. That's how the internet works, it's distributed. You take out any one part of it, the rest of it still works. If we have an energy system that is the same, then again, you take out one part of the energy system, the rest of it still works. And it's not necessarily going to be taken out by war. It could be extreme weather events, such as we saw in South Australia the other week. So if you have a distributed energy system, hopefully it will be more robust and more people will keep energy, a, a reliable supply of energy than if it was centralised. And then, yeah, if the generator breaks down, everyone loses out. It's also more efficient um, and uh, potentially lower cost and so on as well. I've mentioned those reasons there. Okay, there's some enabling technologies for the smart grid. One is in, uh, information communication technology. The other, one, the, the other one is storage, absolutely critical for renewable energy which uh, is variable over time and place. The good news is that the cost of battery storage has been dropping rapidly, about halving every three years. So. We're going to see batteries become much more common in households and in energy systems generally to allow uh, more and more renewables into the system. Uh, another enabling technology is power electronics, which is another one of my research interests. Basically, things are getting smaller. So again, like communications technology, we had mobile phones which started out the size of bricks. Now they're the size of a packet of cards. Power uh, electronics and, and uh, that technology is going in the same direction. Okay, energy and transport. In a couple of minutes I'll try and cover this. So I mentioned before transport consumes about a third of the energy that we um, utilise overall. It can't be ignored. Um, also, uh, you, you probably have, I don't know, has any, have either of you seen an electric vehicle on the road where you live? Raise your hands if you have. You have. Fantastic. Okay. There's not many around in Australia, okay? But the numbers will be increasing, I think, quite rapidly over the coming decade. In fact, the predictions are that there'll be about a million electric vehicles on the road in Sydney in 10 years' time. Already in Norway, 20% of um, vehicles, uh, new vehicles, are, are fully electric. And that's for a number of reasons I won't go into. There are other parts of the world where electric vehicles are becoming much more common. I think of it as an electric vehicle as a battery on wheels because in a, an electric vehicle you have a, a battery which is much larger than the battery that you might put in your garage. Now this is good and bad because you have to charge the battery 
and it can take time depending on the size of the battery. And that can also load the grid where you are if you're plugging it in. On the other hand, you can also take energy from your electric vehicle and put it back into the grid if you need to. And this is called, um, oh, well, okay, here's a little joke. Green transport. Does that look like green transport? Or that? Um, this is a dendrobium. It's faster than a Tesla. You've heard of a Tesla? Okay, this one does zero to 100 in about two seconds. So, um, uh, yeah, that's the evolution of electric vehicles. The cost of vehicles is low. So one of the questions I wanted to put to you was, why don't people get electric vehicles? One reason they usually give is cost, but actually if you look at the, the numbers, it's cheaper to own most electric vehicles over the lifetime of the vehicle than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Another reason people give is range. Uh, it won't get me to where I want to go. Living in, in the west of uh, New South Wales, okay, that might be a reason. But living in Sydney or a major city, almost any in the, anywhere in the world, it's been shown that 85% of people don't need an electro, the range of an internal combustion engine vehicle. An electric vehicle, your average electric vehicle would be perfectly adequate. And we've found that for Sydney as well. We've done a study on that in Sydney. Charging infrastructure, there's nowhere to charge up your vehicle. That's the third reason people usually give. Well, that's going to change in future too fairly rapidly. Here's a couple of pictures of what a typical charging station might look like. You're getting shade as well as energy at the same time. The, uh, the one on the left, any surplus energy goes back into the distribution grid. The one on the right, there's a couple of batteries there. So this is a portable solar charging station. It's not actually connected to the grid at all. The energy that's produced by the solar cells goes into the battery and then when a vehicle comes up, it's transferred from the battery in the charger to the battery in the vehicle. Um, okay, I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail in charging infrastructure, but wireless power transfer is another method of um, charging vehicles, which is gonna become more, more common. At the moment, you're probably familiar with the plugs that you plug into a vehicle, actually, they won't be, they, they will be a thing of the past. So you'll just drive over a pad and it will inductively transfer the energy into the vehicle. Um, this also means that you can transfer energy more easily back to the grid as well. So you can have bi-directional energy transfer into and out of the battery in your vehicle through this wireless link. Uh, that, that raises some interesting possibilities which I'll mention briefly in a moment. So vehicle to grid, I mentioned that, yeah, if you have a vehicle, you can put energy back into the grid. This actually was very useful in Japan. You might remember the Fukushima nuclear accident when the tsunami came in and, and damaged the nuclear power station. So a lot of people lost uh, their energy, their electricity supplies at that time. But in Japan, electric vehicles are a bit more common. And what they could do is they could take their electric vehicle, plug it into their household and run their critical appliances from the energy in their vehicle. So vehicle to the grid uh, is another way of utilising electric vehicles um, to manage your own energy usage. Uh, it doesn't have to be in an emergency, but uh, yeah, it helps us to manage our energy, particularly in the light of more variable renewable sources coming online. Um, Okay, charging infrastructure is increasing. That's the point of that slide, but uh, I won't dwell on that. Um, when and where you charge matters. Will electric vehicles have an impact on the grid? The answer is it depends. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through the reasons here, but uh, I'll leave that one for you guys to have a look at. Um, possible business scenarios. There's a whole range of business scenarios that might arise around electric vehicles, whether you own the vehicle, whether you don't own the vehicle. Um, a couple of interesting ones that you might have heard of are autonomous vehicles where they drive themselves. They don't need a driver, they run based on GPS. And I can imagine, and I hope you can too, that you might have an electric vehicle that is autonomous. Uh, you dial it up like an Uber vehicle. It comes and picks you up without a driver, takes you where you want to go, and then goes off, picks up the next person, or if it needs to, it can go to a charging station where it drives over one of those wireless charging pads, charges up, and then goes off and goes back into the pool. So this is almost like a public transport system, but it's door to door. So 
So in conclusion, um, any energy infrastructure is going to change substantially over the next two decades. It's really going to affect you guys. Uh, we need to use the available energy more efficiently to make our current sources last longer, but we also need to develop new forms of energy, new resources, mainly renewable energy resources, and we're going to see transport become electrified, and this will have a big impact on energy as well, because as I said, a third of our energy goes on transport currently. To do this, we're going to need to develop a smart infrastructure around energy systems and how we manage our energy. So intelligent buildings, uh, intelligent transport, and the smart grid, which is the one I've mostly spoken about here. So there's lots of problems, and it's engineers that are going to be solving these problems in the future. In some ways, it's exciting times. And I'll just finish on this picture. So ICT is information and communication technology. We've seen how our lives have been transformed over the last couple of decades by information and communication technology with the internet, mobile phones and so on. When you combine that with energy, you get a smart grid. Uh, when you combine information and communication technology with transport, you get intelligent transport, autonomous vehicles and so on. Now, because of the significant link between transport and energy, I think that's going to be the link for and the, and the solution for increasing the amount of renewable energy we, we rely on and use in our lives going forward. So thanks for your attention. If you've got any questions, I'll be more than happy to, to try and answer them. Okay, so um, did I put the numbers on here? It depends on what you're charging from. Uh, here we go. So your um, typical um, household charger uh, will, will charge an average electric vehicle overnight if from, from empty to full. But a Tesla vehicle has about four times the battery capacity. So you'd actually have to charge that for more than a day if it was going from empty to full at home. On the other hand, there are fast chargers that will charge a Tesla in half an hour but you need a small power station almost to, to do that. So the, uh, the, there's other numbers which I've given here. Uh, in fact, yes, so page 36, there's three or four levels of charger mentioned there um, and the amount of current that they, and power that they can provide. And for a typical vehicle, you would use about 10 kilowatt hours a day. Your typical commuter would use about 10 kilowatt hours a day. So to replenish that every day, on each of those different charging um, technologies, you'd need somewhere between 10 minutes and four hours. Even in, in Norway, um, they get a lot less sunlight than we do, um, but the uptake of electric vehicles there is very strong. And the reason for that is they have a hot, lot of hydroelectricity resources. So, uh, what they do is they buy energy from the rest of Europe when it's cheap, pump water up into dams, and then uh, when the rest of Europe wants it back, they sell it back at a higher price, or they use it for their own domestic needs. Um, so energy trading is, is the answer to this. You need to be able to collect energy in one place and then transport it to where it's needed. That's one example in Europe. Uh, we could transport uh, energy not in the form of coal, but maybe through a wire, electricity, to Indonesia. That's being talked about. So we could, you know, uh, from Australia to, to Asia, we could transport energy in that way. Um, there's, there's options, okay? Hydrogen is another way of storing energy and transporting it. There's already been wars over oil, I think people would say, in Kuwait and so on. Um, look, when resources get scarce, um, uh, nasty things can happen and, and it's really up to us to uh, foresee this as much as we can and do our best to prevent it through both technical means, you know, engineers are working to uh, provide our infrastructure to make sure people maintain their standard of living. Uh, but there's also political means and economic means. The more trade we have, the more reliant on each other we are and the less likely um, wars and things are likely to happen.
Yes, I do. And, and the reason is, is that um, uh, if you look at carbon emissions in Australia, historically, when the carbon tax was introduced, carbon emissions started going down. Uh, energy usage started to um, uh, flatten off. That is, we were using what we had more efficiently and there was more photovoltaic coming into the system. When the carbon tax was removed, carbon emissions immediately started going up again. So economic levers have a real impact on people's behaviour. And if we want to change the way people are behaving, that is another way of, of doing it. Energy trading, oh, sorry, carbon trading is another approach. Um, there's arguments for and against taxes versus trading and cap and trade. Uh, I, I'm not an expert and I can't go into that now, but, but certainly economic tools for managing people's behaviour are important. Selling it politically is a challenge, but it's important. I'm aware of buses, electric buses that are being produced and actually used, quite large buses. Uh, I think that's the next thing that we'll see becoming more common. But of course, um, agriculture and all of that industry depends on heavy vehicles also. Uh, whether they get run off uh, batteries or maybe um, hydrogen fuel cells is, is a question I can't answer. A lot of forklifts used in uh, factories, you know, um, a lot of forklift vehicles are already run on hydrogen uh, fuel cells. And it could go that way for the, the larger vehicles. Uh, pressurised hydrogen has a very high energy density and that's what you need to run vehicles for a long period of time. Uh, it comes down to the technology available and the costs and I'd have to have a crystal ball to tell you which way it's going to go except for the fact that every th form of transport is going to have to become electrified. It will have electric motors driving it. So you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, you want to distribute those solar farms all over the country. And one of the advantages of doing that is if you've got rain and bad weather and cloud cover in one part of the country, another part of the country is likely to be sunny. And so again, the, the weather, th these impacts average out and having a distributed energy resource makes it much more reliable and more robust. That's a very deep question, which um, it's very difficult for me to answer. Um, I think uh, I mentioned politics before is, is part of it, our political system and the priorities of, of our uh, government as determined by the voters and the interest groups, the miners and others that are a part of the, the democratic system. Um, all I can say is when I look at industry, they are actually making the changes. They see the economic sense, they see uh, the sense in being uh, proactive in, in moving to more efficient energy um, sources and uh, being more efficient with energy and using other energy sources. So ultimately it will come down to being an economic thing and people will just say, look, it's cheaper for me, I'm going to do it. Uh, it's not obvious to people at the moment. For example, with electric vehicles, I think it's perfectly sensible for most people to have an electric vehicle today. Although most people aren't aware of it, there are questions in their minds and they have to, you know, be educated or learn uh, to, to um, what, where the truth is for them as well as, you know, more broadly. So it's a, it's a very complicated question and I don't think there's a simple or a single answer. Uh, but I, I think you can understand that too. I think telling your friends will help, you know? <laughs> That's what I'm doing here. Um, as more and more people understand and become aware of what's possible and uh, what can happen if we don't make changes, then I think these changes will happen naturally. Okay, so I'm sorry, but you've, you've, there's a couple of wrong statements there, okay? First of all, carbon doesn't destroy ozone. It's fluorocarbons, 
which are a different chemical form of carbon. All right, so a couple of few decades ago, people noticed that uh, fluorocarbon emissions from uh, spray cans and things were causing the ozone layer to thin and eventually disappear. And um, action was taken globally to restrict the uh, use of fluorocarbons. And what's happened is that over time, uh, the, the ozone layer has, has healed itself. Now, ozone is produced by sunlight, ultraviolet light particularly, falling on the upper atmosphere and, and uh, interacting with, with oxygen there. So it, it gets produced at a certain rate. Uh, if there's fluorocarbons going up into the atmosphere, it's being destroyed at a certain rate. What we've done is we've realised the problem and stopped destroying the ozone. So that's, that's healed itself. Carbon emissions are a different matter. They form a sort of a blanket on the Earth which traps heat. And this changes weather patterns uh, and, and all the other things that, that are associated with, with climate change. So hydroelectricity specifically is, is storing, energy, uh, storing water in dams and then letting it run downhill and converting its kinetic energy into electricity. Um, the water gets up there either because it rains and fills up a dam or it's pumped up to the dam. Uh, wave energy is, um, I wouldn't call it hydroelectricity, it, it of course is, has to do with water, but it's capturing the energy in waves and converting that to usually electricity using um, different approaches, slightly different approaches, yeah. There's also tidal energy, if you can capture water moving in and out of estuaries, then it's, a, it's very much like hydroelectricity. You've got water flowing and you convert that to electricity. It, it is very regular. The size of tides vary, so it can vary from, you know, week to week, day to day, whatever. Uh, but the tides will always be there. Uh, you could say the sun is always there, but of course you can't predict cloud cover quite as well. So um, photovoltaic energy, solar energy is more variable than tidal energy, absolutely. And thanks for the great questions too.